Welcome to the uh, Open Labs Artist Talk. Um, the exhibition uh, opened last night, and everyone had a very long and lovely night and is enjoying themselves, celebrating uh, the show. Um, so uh, what we are going to do today is introduce you to some of the artists, scientists, producers uh, that are featured in the exhibition and have a bit of a conversation. Uh, my name is Zach Denfeld. I work with the Office of Life and Art and our studio um, curated and helped put this show together with uh, Science Gallery Dublin. Um, and I'm gonna introduce to you to these folks in just a second. Uh, one thing I think is put maybe potentially quite unique about this um, show is how it brings together these different spaces from around the world, here to Dublin, uh, here to Ireland, here to Science Gallery Dublin. Um, but that a lot of the practitioners in this space uh, circulate between these places. So what's particularly uh, enjoyable for me is that I know all these folks for yeah, quite a few years now. And um, so my own um, journey as an artist has brought me not only uh, over and over again to Science Gallery Dublin, but also to their open labs. And so I think that's maybe something we'll hear a bit more about is how people kind of share their ideas and their research across these spaces. Okay, so. If you haven't seen the exhibition yet, uh, Open Labs is a show that brings together uh, the sort of ideas, research, uh, tools, and methodologies of four uh, art, science, technology hybrid spaces that exist in Finland, Netherlands, United States, and India. Um, and each of the four uh, Open Labs are represented by pavilions, these sort of triangular shaped items in the galleries, as well as by larger artworks uh, produced by artists, uh, designers, and technologists who have visited those labs at some point in their artistic journey. And we're currently sitting in Open Shop, which is the fifth lab in the show where we'll be bringing together hands-on programming throughout the next 13 weeks, uh, as well as folks from Trinity College sharing their research in action uh, and folks from the larger Dublin uh, creative community. So uh, stay tuned and do uh, visit us a few times here. Uh, but let me just quickly um, identify the people that'll be speaking for most of this so you won't be hearing my raspy voice. Uh, and we actually had a bit of a conversation beforehand about how people identify their own practice. So I'm gonna let them do that because uh, it's complicated. <laughs> uh, so sitting next to me is uh, Selby. Um, Selby and I met randomly on the street in Paramar Paramaribo, Suriname in 2005. We literally just ran into each other, uh, shook hands, have been friends ever since. Um, he's uh, representing hackers and designers. Shreyasi and I were unsure if we met when she was an undergraduate in Bangalore, uh, but um, Shreyasi was a student uh, at the Shristi uh, School of Art, Design, and Technology, <clears throat> and then uh, for a good number of years ran Art Science Bangalore, who is one of our labs here and is currently uh, studying in Finland, so it's a bit closer by. Uh, Paritza is from um, bi the renamed BioArt Society and is not an artist, and she'll tell us what she actually is. Um, and uh, again, BioArt Society for me was one of those lovely institutions that I ran into online and had the great pleasure of visiting um, their Kilpi CRV uh, biological research station um, uh, workshop residency about three years ago, which is in the north of uh, Finland. We'll be hearing about that, I think. Yeah, great. And then uh, Connor Courtney. Uh, oh, I said your last name. I wasn't supposed to, sorry. Just Connor um, is uh, a long time Science Gallery Dublin and Science Gallery International alum, doing all kinds of projects. And for the last two and a half years, um, has been working in my studio as well. Uh, but uh, here today, he's gonna tell us about Public Lab because he did a lot of the work to bring the tools from public labs um, space and, and build them and, and learn about them so that he could teach the wider community. Yeah, great. Um, so one of the questions that a lot of people have been asking us are how do I start my own open labs and how do you even get into this stuff? So I might ask each of these uh, fine folks to tell us a bit of how they got here today. What did you study? What got you interested in these sort of uh, unusual hybrid practices? Uh, we won't let you go on too long, but love to just open up that conversation. Um, so I studied art and new media, my bachelor, and then fine arts, my master. And um, I think Ellie, she's not, she's protesting the environment, so that's good. She's not here, but uh, she asked me 
can I join Hackers and Designers or can I start my own Hackers and Designers in uh, Dublin? And I said, well, uh, go ahead. You just have to do it. Uh, but it's maybe not a sufficient answer to uh, start a lab like Hackers and Designers or a lab. We never called ourselves a lab though, but since. What would you call yourself? I think a group. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what what we noticed, we were running first in uh, space, and we had to program it. And then every Thursday in the month, we organized an event which is called Hackers and Designers, and which was quite popular, and it kind of grew from that. So uh, it was only a four-hour evening. And then it was a weekend a month, and then we did a summer school, so that was uh, two weeks a year, and it gradually developed and more people kind of joined us and our network grew. So, and so I couldn't put my finger, I couldn't give a clear answer as you can hear how to start a thing. But I think what happens is that you have to have like-minded people and I'm stealing Britta's sentence. You have to ha also have people to really are dedicated to do stuff and who kind of, uh, we call it in the Netherlands, pull the car. Uh, so uh, who are driven and we have a couple of people with us who are really good at doing this. So I, before we would just pass on the microphone, I just want to stick with you for a second more, um, just because I know a bit about your, your history and practice. You actually kind of worked as a, I guess we could say, new media contemporary artist uh, for a long time. Um, but Hackers and Designers has the word designers in the title, has the word hackers, doesn't have the word artist. You know, how do these kind of three words, let's say hacking, art, design, uh, sit in terms of your own thinking and, and it, was there a transition or were those always kind of in the mix? I, I definitely think they were always kind of in the mix and we, or at least I didn't really think about what it was. It was more, uh, we have a com common interest in uh, learning stuff by uh, uh, making it. And that's definitely something we do a lot. Uh, we are interested if like, Twitter bots, you read in the news, uh, Twitter bots kind of uh, 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 voted that an orange president is in the United States now. And then we kind of curious what are Twitter bots. Well, let's make a couple of Twitter bots, see what's actually happening. And this kind of idea, I think it's throughout my uh, art practice as well. And it's, yeah, you can ha do it in your design practice as well or in your science practice. It's not, so you, I think that's also the common ground that we're curious and we start making stuff. And uh, maybe just emphasize making stuff, you also open things up. That exactly. like, okay, what is a Twitter bot? Let's actually just make one, but part of it is then looking at a Twitter bot pulling off the top, opening up the code, opening up the black box. Exactly, and play with it and see what we can do with it as well. Um, by the way, we're gonna have Q&A from the audience, so start thinking of your questions. In about 15 minutes, we'll hand it over to you. Uh, but first, let's hear from uh, Shreyasi. Tell us how you got, how you got here, because you, you didn't actually initially study art or design, or, right? Um, I studied filmmaking, okay. actually, for my undergrad. And um, that's, like, it's strange how I landed, because when I was in my undergrad, I think some of the early uh, courses run by ArtScience PLR had already started because at that point uh, it was, oh, it's so weird to hear my own voice <laughs> echoing. <laughs> but um, so when I was a student, I could see that uh, Yashas was running these really, uh, Yashas uh, Shetty, who's the, uh, the founder of ArtScience PLR, he was running these really cool courses, uh, which were the iGEM projects over summer. And hey, maybe we could just say what iGEM is for folks. Has anyone heard of iGEM? No? no? Okay, okay. Good, yeah. So iGEM is uh, International Genetically Engineered Machines, I think, and it's a, uh, it's a competition at MIT for uh, genetically engineering things, <laughs> whatever you want, and they basically give out these bio bricks, and uh, it's an open competition for universities and schools all over the world, and you participate in it and you create your own genetically modified machine. And uh, so initially, uh, he was running these courses while I was a student, so I'd heard about it. And once I graduated, I kind of got involved with the lab more for like, hey, you're doing some cool film stuff, because I was doing like analog film and photography and like having a very like art science approach to like chemistry and image making. And uh, I was uh, joining the lab to help do some admin stuff. And then I saw all these cool things happening around me and I had to get involved. 
So that's my, uh, that's my journey. And then we actually had a space. So it wasn't running from course to course, but we actually had a dedicated space where we ran an electronics lab, a bio lab, a music lab, because I think sound is something that all of us at Art Science BLR were really passionate about. And yeah, so that's how Art Science BLR came about. And it's essentially a space uh, which is for artists and designers to engage with science and scientific practices, uh, to make it more accessible to communities in general, and also to have dialogues about technologies, like whatever that can mean, whether it's biotechnology or like a Twitter bot or like what's there inside this computer. So anything to do with technology, to have conversations and like understand what the implications of these technologies are across. So one, one thing I find really interesting about a lot of these spaces, but I, I know Art Science Bangalore maybe a bit more, I spend a lot of time with you guys. Yeah. Thanks for letting me in, by the way, <laughs> and hang out with y'all. Um, you know, on one day, you'll maybe be doing a small workshop for young children in um, one of the informal sediments of Bangalore around their water quality and making their own microscopes. But the next day, you're also talking to some of the world's leading life scientists at National Center for Biological Sciences. So. It's, it's really interesting to me that you're doing sort of um, public engagement with, let's say, young people who are just maybe starting to get interested in the natural world, the natural sciences, but you're also really engaging you know, some pretty sophisticated technology and thinkers. And how, you know, how do you guys make sense of that? Or is it a translational process about bringing knowledge from one space to another? Or, yeah, going between those extremes, I guess. Mm, absolutely. I think uh, what you said about it being a translational process is that it's very much about making this accessible because to do a lot of the science, we do need help from the scientists. And uh, But then one of our goals is to demystify the science because uh, like if you look at a lot of the DIY low cost equipment that we are building, it is essentially de-black boxing whatever is there in the labs. And it's essentially understanding how these things work, how they are built and making it more approachable for people to do so. And I think we are incomplete without our collaborations on either end. So we need our collaborations with the scientists because most of us are not scientists ourselves. And they have kind of like bring in perspectives and uh, from their own discipline, which is vital to our practice. But then at the same time, we are kind of incomplete without it passing on to the community or the community being a part of our experiments. This is actually maybe a perfect transition to talk about BioArt Society, because one of the things uh, in listening to the interview uh, that was conducted with, uh, with, with you guys that's over in the, uh, the pavilion, and I, I, this really struck me, um, was that uh, you were making a distinction between art and science and art science. Uh, I, I don't know if, if uh, folks will, will hear that in the interview, but if you have any thoughts about uh, bringing two different things together or like going across them, or how, how do you guys think about art and science? So hello, yeah, I'm Birita Puhta from the Bioart Society, and thank you for inviting us here. Uh, yeah, well, I guess in that interview, uh, uh, because the question was for, formulated in, in such way like there would be art and science, but uh, that felt very strange to us, so we, we um, I guess we, we, we always talk about working within the field of art and science, which is... Um, uh, combines uh, things. It's it's not two separate things, but they are a, a practice in itself, a f artistic field in itself. Um, so and, and how did you yourself then? Where, did you uh, come from either of those fields to get here? Because we haven't heard yet about your journey. So uh, yeah, well, I, I actually am a producer curator. I my background is in. Um, Originally, I have a degree in political science, then in arts management, and then in cultural theory. So I, and I have worked as a freelance producer uh, in all kinds of um, what's maybe considered marginal. Um, we, we, I've organized performance clubs and, and, and be working with contemporary dance and, and theater, but with even in there a bit of a sort of a so-called weirder projects, but I, um, this is because I believe that on the edges of, of, of this cultural field, there happens what's interesting. And then eventually I, uh, I was working with a visual um, artist, Terike Haapoja, who has been involved with BioArt Society. 
And then she told that there's a, a, a project that they were looking for someone to, to do it. And so I then joined BioArt Society it's about seven years ago. BioArt Society is about 10 years old. We had 10 year anniversary last year. And um, yeah, I mean, ever since I m there was a break, but I w w I've been, been with Erich Berger, the director, and, and, and with the group. And I guess in the beginning it was fun also just because it was weird. I didn't have connection to bio art or, or any of this art and science. But, you know, over the time it's also that um, it's, it, 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 the field has developed enormously in Finland. The Bio Art Society has done an amazing job with, the, with the creating connections, networks within Finland but also abroad. And it's uh, enormously uh, interesting, stimulating, and important what's done. Because, uh, I mean, many of the topics we work with, with, with science and with, with art, they are also in the heart of the kind of social, uh, so societal development, and, and it, they're important also politically. And, I mean, this is where I come from. I, I always take all the topics into the social context or into the larger society, because that's you know, I find that artists have a, a role in this, what uh, is common, what we are building together in a society. And, and, and we as a socia uh, society has a responsibility also, we get funding, we, get, we, we are active um, actors developing um, both the field. We, by our society develops, produces and facilitates um, um, this kind of art and science project. We, our focus is especially art and natural sciences, medical sciences, um, and life sciences. But lately also humanities have very heavily stepped in. <laughs> so we, we work very much in the con where, where art and science meet. And I just want to pick up on three themes before we go over to Connor, because I've actually heard a lot of, uh, in my mind anyways, repeated interesting similarities. And one of them was what you just said, which is that, um, you know, by art society has an amazing track record, has done amazing work. But like all of these spaces, when you actually go and visit, you know, the spaces themselves can be quite small. And so I think they p open labs uh, potentially punch way above their weight based on the circulation of people and ideas. So, you know, I always like to invite as many of my friends and colleagues as I can over to Dublin. And I think Science Gallery Dublin has, has, has quite a strong reputation. But then they get here and they say, oh, it's, it's quite a bit smaller than I thought. Uh, but then, like you saw last night, the number of people that come through in an opening and the energy that's here is really what carries it forward. So I think that's potentially something that distinguishes these kind of much smaller, uh, nimble groups as they have to sort of circulate people and ideas much more widely and quickly because the physical infrastructure is not always so strong uh, or it might just be you move around four times in you know four years. So that's one theme. And the second theme is uh, this sort of critical approach to technology and science. And we've used a, a term that maybe we should define a little bit more a few times, black box. Right? So there's this metaphor of like, especially with computers, there's a black box, things happen inside, we don't really know how or why, and we should accept that that's okay. And I think what, you know, uh, a critical approach that most, most of us here take to science and technology say, hold on a second, we need to open that up, we need to ourselves learn about it, uh, maybe uh, make sure that folks who haven't had a chance to look inside or to, uh, uh, the public in general has a chance to reflect and be critical, and that maybe it's okay just to stick our finger in as long as we don't electrocute ourselves and just see what happens, right? To explore and play, to un un unpack that. Um, so that was, that was a, a second uh, theme uh, that I wanted to bring up. So let's go over to Connor. I'll, I'll skip the third theme. That'll be good. Um, Connor, you're, Hello. Uh, maybe uh, you could tell us a bit about uh, your, your journey. And I know, I know you just kind of started in science, but you have had gotten more and more interest as you went. Um, ah, and that was my third theme. Everyone just learned on the job. <laughs> uh, sorry. Yeah. That, like, you guys were like, yeah, I didn't actually know much about science or biology. Yeah, it's just we had a lab, you know. Um, so that was the third theme. But um, so maybe you could tell us a bit about your journey. But also, you're here today because uh, Public Lab didn't. Um, uh, unfortunately, send anyone over from the U.S., but that's fine because they sent all their cool stuff, yeah. and you kind of unboxed it and yeah. set it up. Um, so maybe tell us about yourself, but also kind of how you help Public Lab uh, come to this exhibition. Sure. Um, so I started out uh, as a microbiologist. Um, that's what I was like. I studied natural sciences here in Trinity, and uh, you know the way the world ended back in 2008. 
you know, when it was just like nobody had anything, no, there was no money. There was like it's like a chemical plant shut down here, and so every single job that I could have gotten with my degree required three years industrial experience. So I ended up just coming in here and starting working as a tour guide uh, on the show called Infectious. So it was like, as I'm a microbiologist, it was like, great, this will help me to like learn how to communicate what I've already learned. Um, and I've basically been uh, working for or with Science Gallery on various projects since then. So that was April 2009. So it was like April will, is my 10th anniversary working for, with Science Gallery. Um, so yeah, as a microbiologist, I had to, uh, that, like my, my background is always in science. I was always like, I, I suppose I would have described myself as a, as a scientific materialist for like the longest time where it was uh, science is objective and technology is amazing and we can fix everything. And uh, the more I learned about everything that was outside of what I already knew, <laughs> the more I learned how little I actually knew at all. Um, and so um, Open Labs is, is a, for me is a fantastic expression of that. Um, that by stepping outside of your own little box, uh, you start to actually really understand the material impacts of ideologies and ideas and the systems that we've constructed to like, harness different types of technology or different types of resource. Um, and that's why I think public labs work, uh, the, the work that they do is really interesting. Um, I know that when we contacted them, um, they were kind of a bit skeptical of the idea of doing an exhibition um, to the point where it was kind of like, okay, well, you, yeah, you can take the tools and do whatever you want with them, and including have an exhibition, I guess. It's all know. open source. It's all, it's it's all open just, source. Just, yeah. just, just, just go and you know, have fun. Um, and so we you took some of their tools and we created a new artwork um, for this show, um, which was a border mapping um, project. So we um, brought some kites and balloons uh, up to just an a really strange little area that's right on the border with the UK here. So it's like between the Republic and the north of Ireland. Um, and so we wanted to examine an area that would have had uh, a major impact in the event of like a, a crisis Brexit scenario. So if like a hard border went back up, there is actually a little loop on the border that is inaccessible by land unless you travel through the UK. So you'd have to go through two checkpoints to get home as an Irish person to this little part of Ireland that's actually just bubbles into the UK. Uh, so we went and we took photographs from above with the balloons um, and stitched them together into a map that's downstairs. Um, but the thing that was really great about that was, you know, you, you, could, you, could, you could just use satellite imagery to create that work as a product that's on the wall. But that's not actually what's interesting. The thing that's interesting is the process and getting down onto the ground and understanding the scale of, of what you're trying to map. And like it took us like two hours to do like, like I don't know, three quarters of a mile maybe. So, and, like, and then you zoom out and you see the border itself is just hundreds of miles that you would have to try to. So it, it's, it's a, the scale of the problem was brought home in that instance. But then also we met people who lived in the local area and talked to them about their concerns and fears or hopes around the, the whole um, chaos of the border scenario that we're like staring down the barrel of like in like 15 days. Is it 15? It's like 14 days. 14 days. So it's like, you know, so we were trying to like just basically having a conversation around um, borders and how they um, separate us. But when you actually, we went to this, we went to the border and it was nothing but serenity and tranquility and the border was invisible, you know? And it's like, it really brought home the fact that there are a lot of things that we see and experience in our lives that seem to be completely concrete, but are actually just completely imagined. And I think that just to sort of uh, say a bit more about public labs since they don't have an official representative here. Yeah. Um, you know, I think what, what uh, draws us to their research and, and their sort of um, way of thinking about tools and technologies is they're really foregrounding the concerns of specific communities and creating uh, tools that help those communities ask the questions that they want to ask. And one of the amazing stories that we heard in an interview with, with uh, one of the public lab uh, affiliates, uh, uh, Jose, was that um, it doesn't always 
need to be high technology, that we really need to uh, get that out of our minds that, um, let's say, digital technology is somehow uh, going to give us a, a better result. So as an example, there was a community that was concerned about environmental air quality uh, and the smell that they uh, were noticing, and there was some discussion about sensors. And then at some point, the citizens themselves became sensors, and they were asked to record when they smelled something and put a time to it. And sort of collecting that uh, data does two things. It sort of logs the experiences of these many individuals, uh, but then by collating it, it gives it a certain rigor and validity that we ask for in terms of environmental air quality data. It didn't necessarily come from a sensor, but the citizens themselves acted as sensors. And I thought that was a really um, unique story in showing how Public Lab thinks about technology is that if a low or medium or inexpensive or high tech solution uh, is needed, that's great, but if what the community is asking can best be answered by using the technology of pen, paper, and a clock. That is also what needs to happen. Um, the, so yeah. the data is all equally valid. Yeah. You know? And, and that, actually, maybe I should ask you to talk about that because I see you nodding, and I know you guys think about this a lot. Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. Like Just bouncing off of that, because we've been working with communities extensively. Uh, it's been really interesting to see how many times in scientific practice and in like the quest for like let me get the number of this parameter you actually ignore the community that is actually associated like that's living there and often what they have to tell whether it be in the form of oral history or their stories or experiences gives you a way better indication of the conditions of that space than like all these numbers and like tools to study scientifically all these parameters can do. And which is why it's also very important to see, think about how we're even communicating it. Because uh, I remember one of the things uh, when we did this extensive water collection and sampling drive along uh, the gold fields in uh, south of India, because we were studying the water for arsenic uh, pollution. And one of the things that we actually asked them was that, like, would you be interested in knowing the results? And most of them were like, we don't care because it's our life goes on. Sure, you can like come back to us and give us numbers, but we really don't care. So then it's also a question of how do you communicate and how, like, how do you visualize uh, whatever you've been studying so that it makes sense for people, so that it becomes a participatory process and so that they are more involved in the environment that surrounds them. Yeah, totally. Oh, what happened? Um, so we're going to open up to questions in just one second, but I did want to um, uh, bring one more uh, quick question, uh, and I have tons more, but I want to hear what you guys have to say. But uh, a lot of uh, the work that you guys do is between um, uh, different um, kinds of practices. And maybe, um, Selby, I can just ask you, with hackers and designers, uh, I guess there's two things I notice. You bring together... Um, people that are potentially like in the technology community of Amsterdam who have a lot of startup money, have a lot of energy and sort of financial support or at least excitement in the market. And then you bring together designers and artists who are often uh, challenged to just make rent. Um, and so um, how do you guys negotiate some of those differences in the sort of subcultures? Um, but also like, um, how do you do that with humor? Because almost everything you guys do is hilarious, I find. And that um, helps me get through the day. So yeah, how, how do hackers and designers hang out and not kill each other? And how do you find um, uh, time to laugh? I think uh, it's really challenging to get the, uh, like to be inclusive and to have also the, uh, especially the startup engineers to go and visit our uh, community. And what we noticed, this is a practical tip, uh, we, we had our events and we had just which be beer was in the supermarkets the cheapest, we bought that because it was a really social event. We did some uh, hacking, we drank some beers and this and that. And then they, they didn't really come. So we had to get craft beers. <laughs> and then it was something interesting also. And, it was, uh, and that was something we never thought of that, uh, oh, so have your beer in order, I would say. <laughs> Um, but next to it, I would say we, there's way more hackers, uh, uh, way more designers and artists who are actually interested in what we are doing than the hackers. And yeah, you really have to be active because there's just, for the, the hackers, it's like a social event. And for us, it's like, it's our practice in a way. It, it, that's more or less what we're doing. 
although everybody has uh, practice their own practice as well, which I didn't tell, but it's not our full-time job. And it's also super busy uh, at times. But uh, to get the hackers involved, it's difficult. And then we want also like uh, uh, an inclusive group. So we uh, we used to tend a lot of, uh, there were a lot of boys. So uh, to be have a more uh, a female crowd. Uh, we are all highly educated. So that's also a very specific demographic, which we also want to challenge, I think, and see how can get we an other public. So it's an ongoing thing, I think, to draw the crowd, have a diversity, and uh, also to drag the hackers in. And then craft beer is apparently the way to go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, why don't we open it up to folks in the audience uh, and see what your questions might be. I will bring, uh, if you have a question, let me know. Put your hand up and I will bring you the microphone. Uh, sorry, if you could just uh, quickly say your name and maybe where you're coming from, if that's useful, and then just give us the question. Hi, hi my, my name is Lawrence, and uh, I, I'm, I'm from a art kind of computer background, too. Uh, I like to design stuff with computers. Um, what I was fascinated about the fact that... Uh, sorry, I didn't catch your middle name. Stressy. Stressy. Yeah, you mentioned that arsenic was... Uh, being extracted in your data set in the south of India. How did, how could you, or how do you think you could explain it in plain man's English that that's toxic to those villages in the future? Mm, so uh, one of the things that uh, we did do was that we were using, uh, like, so we were doing two tests while doing this arsenic thing. And thankfully, the water that we tested uh, near the villages was clear of arsenic. Okay. So there wasn't much to be communicated about, like, hey, please stop drinking your yeah. water. We didn't, thankfully, have to do that communication. They were living in a healthy ecosystem. But uh, our way to visualize this was, uh, so we were uh, relying on this kit, which actually did kind of like a shade card uh, test for the arsenic that was uh, being there. So it was much easier to communicate through color and to design that into our communication instead of like talking about the numbers and this is the co concentration in parts per million. And the other thing that we were uh, uh, developing was uh, at the biodesign project, which was a collaboration project between EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland, and Life Patch in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, and Art Science PLR in Bangalore, India. Uh, so we were developing uh, bacteria which would glow if there was arsenic present in the water as bioreporters. And uh, so this was also our test for that. And for this, uh, one of our collaborating artists, she had designed uh, an art piece where, depending on the glow, there would be a drop of black ink which drops into the water. So then it's much more easier to see it visually in that sense. Uh, like, so then if it's, the concentrations are higher, so the water's murkier, and that's a relation that you make yourself by looking outside and when you're talking about water for drinking. Sorry, have you ever Sorry. approached any of the animation companies like Brown Bag in I Dublin um, to sell that idea that, that you just had there on educating five-year-olds that this is something that we need to uh, discuss in, in, in classroom? Um, uh, well, I mean, animations are great, and I know that uh, that a lot of school programs are changing to include that. But I think uh, that sense, we our style would more be like grab those five-year-old kids, let's sit down and build some stuff together that talks about this instead of like seeing a video. So we are definitely more hands-on, and like it's we find it's a lot easier to talk about concepts when you're building something together and sharing that time. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you for your question. question. I think really uh, maybe some of you have a reflection on that. So I have actually two questions. One is, um, where do you think as labs or collectives or organizations you are in 10 years and in 20 years? And uh, what is your view on kind of the relation between academic knowledge uh, production and the lab-based knowledge, knowledge production? Who wants to take that one first? <laughs> 
Um, I must say we don't have a very long time uh, plan. And I almost would say that's intentional. Like, uh, for instance, our funders, we, we're now getting uh, funds from the, they really like us to uh, what they call professionalize, so uh, that we actually have a long time term strategy. Whereas we really like this idea, what I was saying, you read in the newspaper about uh, self-driving cars. Let's start making a self-driving car. It's kind of, and then not uh, ask the funders, and then because then you're a year further, and then kind of the energy is still there, but it's a different approach. Then you read it, you, you roll up a group of people who are interested, and just start making it. So uh, I would say for us, there, so there's no, we sometimes talk about this, but there's not really a, a, a long time planning. And, but we do like to challenge the academic system, I would say, that's very dramatically spoken, but uh, like it, master's degrees and all these things, it's super expensive. And yeah, yeah, this is, I don't mean it demeaning, but yeah, what you learn, you can do it also with a group of interested people uh, and in other ways and in a very hands on as we do it. So we, I do think for the long term, it's like having a project next to academics and it's not some, something we uh, looking into. Oh, and uh, so what we do is deprofessionalize. And we actually wrote it in a funding application, which was, of course, quite odd. But I think it's definitely something uh, uh, we think about how these funding systems kind of work and how to be uh, spontaneous and uh, energetic in a way. So I think deprofessionalization and like unlearning and uh, demaking, like downstairs we have like the, the, the toy hacking. It's a kind of demaking kind of thing. Like you have a very nice infrastructure with a mouse and a keyboard, which works, everybody knows it. Well, let's try something which is super inconvenient and see how that works and challenge that kind of status quo. So uh, I don't know if I asked your, uh, answered your question, but no. I would say the academics, yeah. Um, it's, yeah, the academic part of it, um, I find uh, really fascinating because I think we're currently living in a space where we're beginning to move away from authority and expertise driven uh, knowledge uh, like generation um, that the m basically we're after seeing that the more um, uh, expert and authoritative like your 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 research goes the more you're going to have to like figure out how to communicate to people who are outside of that. Like you need interdisciplinary space uh, in order to actually, you know, get people together and then you all come to a consensus on how, you know, what the impact is of this, whatever it is that we're looking at, like the, 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 the research that we're doing. Um, so I think, yeah, we're moving away from authority, authority and hierarchy and more to uh, consensus and collaboration. And like, that's what I would hope for for the future, that the only way that we're going to be able to get through all of the challenges that's f that are facing us right now is for us to actually band together, as opposed to trying to continue to just generate profit and pretend that we can keep going with the world, that the world, the way the world is right now. Like, we can't do that. It's not sustainable. So I think what we're trying to do is to prototype new ways of knowing and new ways of living in the world at the same time, so. Just uh, what, um, since we uh, collaborate a lot with universities, uh, and, and I, how would I? <laughs> what I see is that the, at least for us, for the uh, f field of art and science, is very strongly growing, and uh, I think it becomes, if, if you can call it, more mainstream the coming years. So in, yeah, in about ten years, it, it's not it's difficult to say what is art and science. I mean, it's going to, to, to be some a practice that people, so I don't know how, what, how it influences bioart society in some sense. I mean, we, we, we are an association made by artists, scientists, so it depends on our members, what they want, uh, how they want to develop it. But I, I would say that I, and in 20 years, I, I really, I mean, I would say that this is a question that what 
do, what will the universities be, for example? What, what, what are they? I mean, we, we, we live in this world where we work a lot with universities, but not that we can influence greatly on, on the kind of larger plans. We can influence on small scale in some collaborations and so on. And, and we, we try to um, find access for artists and, and, and practitioners to, to go and work with scientists and with the scientific kind of tools to be able to kind of spread the knowledge and the skills. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's, uh, I actually, if I completely honestly say, I believe eventually at least our association will disappear because we are not needed anymore. That's how I see it. Um, I think for art science, BLR, especially it's uh, interesting because we actually housed within a university. I mean, uh, within Srishti, and which is a design uh, institute. So then the conversation actually becomes very different but then at the same time we have been invited in the past by a very academic and very proper places to come learn about our ways of doing things because there is something there to be learned as well and at the same time we do rely pretty heavily on academic knowledge as well so i i mean i don't know where art science vlr will be in 10 years but yeah but i think it's uh, like knowledge going both ways that's happening. So, yeah. Oh, we have time for about one more question. If anyone has a burning one, we'd love to hear it. Okay, if there's no question, let's thank our uh, speakers very much. Thank you, Zach. And we uh, hope you enjoy the Open Labs exhibition and uh, keep your eye out for future events. Mm -hmm.